wa ashabihi ajma'in. Thank you all for coming. Um, alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen. Um, this, it's so beautiful to see some of the fruits of this initiative coming to life. Um, and alhamdulillah, we're so proud of Sister Hajra and uh, everyone who encouraged her and supported her uh, to make this a reality uh, here at the Muslim Center of Greater Princeton. Um, all of us are very well aware, um, uh, in some cases, uh, we, just, we shouldn't say all of us are aware, but you know, Muhsin has become a household name, mashallah, um, in the community as a sign that Muslims are starting to understand the great uh, amana, the great trust uh, that is caring for our families with special needs um, and making sure that they have community and support and access to resources from within the Muslim community. And, and alhamdulillahi rabbil alameen, we're so blessed uh, to begin this journey here at the Muslim Center of Greater Princeton and only growing from here. Um, and subhanAllah, once you offer something, you know, as they say, you know, if you build it, they will come, you know, alhamdulillah. And, and, and we look forward to, inshallah, being there for all of the families uh, who, inshallah ta'ala, need us. Um, and so I just want to thank, once again, the organizers, Sister Hajra, Muhsin, for, for coming through, Sheikh Saad for joining us. Um, it's such a great blessing. And inshallah ta'ala, we'll turn it over to Aman uh, to uh, take us home, inshallah. Assalamualaikum warahmatullah. Uh, my name is Aman Patel. I'm the respite and volunteer coordinator for Mohsin. It's Muslims Understanding and Helping Special Education Needs. So alhamdulillah, we are grateful to be with you all today. Thank you so much for opening the doors of your community, welcoming us in for your hospitality. Um, you know, mashallah, you have a beautiful center. And it is silver certified, alhamdulillah, which if you don't know what that means, inshallah, we'll, we'll run you all through it at some point uh, through the evening. But alhamdulillah, Mohsin is a nonprofit organization it was founded on the basis of opening the doors of our community to everyone, to, to people with all kinds of unique abilities and disabilities, uh, a community of people who may have been forgotten. And I'm going to take one minute just to briefly share with you guys, with different masajid that we go to, with all of these different organizations that we've worked with, alhamdulillah, something we've seen as a commonality is that We've seen masajid thinking, alhamdulillah, we're growing, we're building, we're expanding. We don't see you know, a certain group of people. We don't have this demographic. We don't have this population. The truth is, whether you know it or not, there's a group of people that may be living in your neighborhood, that may be living in the same neighborhood as this masjid, that may be living just a mile away, that have never set foot in here because they don't know that it's open and accessible. So tonight is step one, having an event for our community where we can talk about it, where we can open the door to conversation. That's step one. Alhamdulillah, you have an amazing facilitator here. Her name is Sister Hajra. I'm going to bring her up for just a minute, inshallah. So if Sister Hajra wants to take over, inshallah. Um, so assalamu alaikum. Um, as the Muslim facilitator, facilitator for the Muslim Center of um, Greater Princeton, I would like to welcome you all here tonight and thank you for your attendance and support. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Hajra Butt. I am a lifelong member and have been very active in youth groups, Saturday school, and the most recently, the newly established Sunday school here. By profession, I am a special education public school teacher. Um, I specialize in children with autism and Down syndrome and behavioral issues. I am thrilled to have um, MCGP finally Muslim certified, as this will open many doors for more diverse families to partake in Majid um, activities. As this program's facilitator, I am the primary contact at um, MCGP for communication regarding accommodations and feedback for children um, and adults alike. My contact information, as well as Mohsin's, will be provided at our meet and greet in MP2 at 8.15, inshallah. So um, I'm going to hand it back to Brother Aman. Aman. Sorry. <laughs> Jazakallah khair. So inshallah, as we mentioned, we do have an evening planned for you all. But inshallah, along with Sister Hajra, we also have Sheikh Saad Taslim. So I could give you the whole bio. I could do that, inshallah. I know he's not going to want me to. But mashallah, Sheikh Saad, what I will say, is a gem. He's somebody that, alhamdulillah, has helped us spread the message of Muhsin. He has shown us and, and committed to us, and alhamdulillah, has you know, educated us and taught us the importance of 
opening the doors of, of inclusivity, and inshallah tonight he's going to do the same for you all. Um, without any further ado, inshallah, I'll bring up a close teacher of mine, Sheikh Saad Taslim. Bismillah, Bismillah, Alhamdulillah, wa salatu wa salamu ala Rasulillah, wa ala alihi wa sahbihi wa man wala. Allahumma la ilma lana illa ma allamtana inna ka anta al-alim al-hakim. Allahumma allimna ma infa'una wa infa'na bima allamtana wa zidna ilma ya Rabbil Alameen. Allahumma arina al-haqqa haqqa warzukna atiba'a wa arina al-baatila baatila warzukna istinaba. Wa salamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First of all, I just want to say thank you for welcoming me and obviously Muhsin uh, in your community. I believe it's the first time I'm coming here. Uh, very impressive so far. I mean, I've, I've just seen the building and I've met a few people. So far, it's very impressive, alhamdulillah. Uh, one of the most impressive things about your community, to me at least, is that you're Muhsin certified. That's awesome, alhamdulillah. I visit a lot of communities. Uh, I travel across North America and other parts as well. Uh, and I can tell you that one of the signs of a flourishing community, for me at least, from what I can see, is how inclusive the community is, how welcoming the community is. And there's a story that I shared uh, during the Jum'ah khutbah today, because I was thinking about my relationship with the Masajid. Uh, and I thought about how, I thought about the first time I took my um, oldest son to the Masjid. It was my first child. And I was very aware of the first impression that a masjid can leave on a child. And not only children, by the way, just anyone. The first time they step into a masjid, whatever happens that first day can have a lasting effect on that individual. And it can actually mold their perception of what this community and what this masjid is like. And I've heard plenty of horror stories. I've heard stories of people coming up and saying things or whatever, people being rude. Uh, people being impatient, with, especially with children and so on and so forth. So my son, I was like, I got to make sure that the first time he comes to the masjid, it's got to be like a perfect experience. Because that, in my mind, I'm like, you know, that's going to set the stage for the rest of his life in terms of how he views the masjid. Does he have a positive association with the masjid? Or does he feel like he's going to go to the masjid and just get yelled at? Right? And, that's gonna, and, they, and then he's going to associate those feelings, subhanAllah, with the deen of Allah with the house of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And yes, that is the responsibility of, of the community and the community members, but as his father, I took it as my responsibility. Like, I got to shield him, I got to protect him. And obviously, first child, you want to protect them from everything bad in the world, right? And so I remember walking into the mission with him. I held his hand. I'm like, just stay close to me. And every time someone would come up, I'd be like, hold up. And they'd be like, so, so I'm like, all right, go ahead. I'm like, what are you going to say? You know, when he's prayed next to me, I said, you know, pray right next to me. Because I know uh, sometimes when kids pray, uh, somebody will come in and be like, what are you doing in the middle of the road? Go to the side. You're a kid. You're not supposed to be here, whatever. And I didn't want, to ha I didn't want him to have that experience. And I can say, alhamdulillah, he had a, he had a pretty good experience. But I thought about uh, my son and what I want for him. And then it is important that as Muslims, we think about all of our children, all of our brothers and sisters and their children. So if we want that for our child, and I'm sure many of you can relate to this, if you want that your child has a pleasant and good experience that is associated with this house of worship, then that is something that we owe to all of our community members. Right? I remember, subhanAllah, uh, I'll share with you how my relationship with Muhsin started. Uh, I was like many people where I had no idea Muhsin even existed. I was at uh, a convention. I was walking through the bazaar. I was trying to get to my lecture on the way, I saw a big banner that said Muhsin and Sister Juhi, some of you may know her, uh, she, she called me over. And I didn't know her, she didn't know me, or I guess she knew me. She called me, she said, come here, come here, let me tell you about Muhsin. And I'm like, sure, I, I got a couple minutes, I'll talk to you. And she started to explain to me that Muhsin wants to serve a section of our community that is completely neglected a section of our community that we turned a blind eye to, that we don't think about. And, you know, out of sight, out of mind, because we don't see, we may not see them in the masjid, we feel like they don't exist, right? Like if we don't have access to them, it doesn't exist. Like other sections of our community as well that can be underrepresented in the masjid. We feel like if they're not in the masjid, they, may, they must not 
exist in the community, but the reality is that just because we're not aware doesn't mean they, they don't exist. And subhanAllah, for some reason, as she was, and she was like pouring her heart out to me, and she really wanted my support, and she wanted me to, and I said to her, I said, what do you want? She said, she said I just want you to know. I just want you to know about Muhsin and the work that we're doing and support us in whatever way you can. And for some reason, like, she was pouring her heart out to me and I told her something that I had never mentioned publicly before. And it's something that I don't really talk about and I hadn't talked about until that moment. I told her, I said, and, and you know, just as she's sharing these stories uh, of these children and these members of our communities who have special needs, I said, you know, something that I almost blocked out of my memory, something that I try not to think about, is just like, I have to recall. And that is that when I was growing up, when I was a child, um, I had a speech impediment. I used to stutter. And it was very serious. Uh, and subhanAllah, um, it affected my confidence, it affected my relationships, making friends, and so on and so forth. I don't really have the time to get into how it can affect a person uh, in many different ways. But alhamdulillah, I was blessed uh, to have a mom who's a psychologist. And she took me to a speech therapist and she worked, she worked with me and got me counseling and so on and so forth. And I think back at that and I, I think about how blessed and, and how merciful Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala was with me that I was able to get the help that I needed. That there was someone there who understood and someone knew that I have needs that are different than, than other children. And if it wasn't for that, and obviously after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and because of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, but if it wasn't for that help and that assistance and that fulfillment of my needs, I can honestly say I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing right now. And sometimes, subhanAllah, I don't even, I, I, I try not to think about my, <laughs> that the fact that I used to stutter because like the memories start coming back and I, I gotta like block it out. And I still have remnants of it today, but alhamdulillah, you know, the fact that I had the support, I had people there to encourage me, my mom actually, uh, she encouraged me, one of the things she told me to do is join the debate team. And I'm like, mom, like I can't even speak to like one person. You want me to speak to like a room full of people, like how am I gonna do that? And alhamdulillah, she had the insight and the foresight and she said, you know what, it's actually gonna help you. Because when, until today, subhanAllah, fire alarm, <laughs> done, okay, alhamdulillah. <clears throat> so till today, on a personal level, I, I identify as an introvert. Or I'm not like a big people person. Put me in front of a huge room to give a talk, I have no problem. Kind of in my zone, I do my thing, I can connect to a large group of people. Put me in a room with three people that I don't know, I'm going to be the most awkward person ever. Right? But alhamdulillah, right, the fact that that was one of the, the coping mechanisms that I had and, and, and actually worked out to my favor, alhamdulillah, that now I can do what I do, once again, because of the help that I got. And that's why when I spoke to Sister Juhi in that moment, and I made it personal, I made it about me. Because oftentimes we have this tendency when we hear about a problem, we have this tendency to otherize it. Right? We think of, well, it's someone else who has this problem. It's other people. And once again, I talk about how if we're not exposed to it, then we feel like the problem doesn't exist. But it is very important that we personalize these issues because this personalization of the plight of our brothers and sisters is a core aspect of our deen. This is what is known as empathy. You know, sometimes people think that our deen preaches sympathy. And as a matter of fact, people talk about, you know, compassion and mercy. And yes, absolutely. But sympathy, when we attach it to mercy, it's, it's very different than empathy. Sympathy is when you look at someone and you, you feel bad for them. You know, simply put, right? You look at someone's situation, you're like, yeah, that's, that's not great. I feel bad. I feel sorry. But the problem with sympathy is that it creates separation between us and the person or the people that we are sympathizing with. Empathy, on the other hand, is when we put ourselves in their position. We try to walk in their shoes. And what empathy does is that empathy brings people together because we try to now connect with the individual. Right? Can I feel what you are feeling? And that brings people together. And that togetherness is another one of the core aspects of our deen, what is known as jama'a or congregation. We are a deen of congregation. If you've ever heard the term ahlu sunnah wal jama'a, what does that mean? It means we are the people of the sunnah, meaning we identify with the sunnah of the Prophet 
we, we attribute ourselves to the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ and we congregate, we come together upon the sunnah of the Prophet ﷺ. It's part of our identity. It is part of us knowing and understanding that the Prophet ﷺ urged us. He said, Alaykum bil jama'ah. He said, I urge you to stick to the congregation. And I warn you to be by yourself, be alone. Why? Well, because the congregation is integral to our faith on a spiritual level, on a communal level, on a social level, on every level. And once again, uh, as someone who identifies as an introvert, you know, I remember when the pandemic started, everyone's like, ah, oh, it's so hard staying at home and not having contact with people, whatever. I was having a great time. I'm like, it's great. Don't need to talk to people. And then eventually, I remember something that my mom told me. I remember uh, when I was in high school, she said, I told her, I said, mom, you know, I could... I think I could just live by myself for the rest of my life. You know, and she said, I don't think you could. Even though, like, you're an introvert or whatever, social needs, yeah, introverts have a different type of social needs, but they still have social needs. They may look a little bit different and so on and so forth, but they still have social needs. And I learned that during the pandemic because initially I was having a great time. But then I began to realize that forget my personal life or my social life, my spiritual life is tied into the congregation. And this is something that I'm sure many of you noticed and you realized when you felt separated from the masjid, when you felt separated from your brothers and sisters, something that we took for granted, coming to the masjid on Jummah and praying with the congregation. And sometimes we may view it as a burden. You know, I got to, Jummah, I, I got to make it to the masjid. I got to go back to work. I got things to do. Like, do I have to go pray and so on and so forth? We realized the blessing of it. Bismillah. We realized the blessing of it when it was taken away from us. We realized how important the congregation is to our faith and that we need this congregation. And that is why the masjid is an integral part of our faith. You know, a couple years ago, uh, there was this whole movement. And those of you who know me, you know I like to keep it real. Right? I don't like to shy away from talking about certain things. But there was a whole, there's this thing called Unmasked. I don't know if you guys saw it, right? And it was like an expose documentary type thing about all the bad stuff or all the problems with our masajid, right? They're not welcoming and this and that and people are rude and whatever else, right? Uh, the sister side is too small always and they don't have access to certain things that men have access to or uh, reverts don't feel welcome, like all those problems, right? And to be honest, a lot of those problems are real problems. And I was actually, I was like, you know, I'm glad that we're talking about this. My issue was with the solution. Because for some people, the solution was, you know what, we don't need the masjid. Let's go find another place where we're going to make our own space where we can welcome one another. And I'm like, that is problematic. Because the masjid cannot be taken out of our faith. The masjid is an integral part of our faith. There are aspects of our worship that can only be performed through the masjid. There are certain rewards that we get that are only attached to the masjid. The tahiyyat al-masjid, the two rak'ahs we pray when we enter the masjid, you don't get that anywhere but the masajid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. The reward of walking to the masjid, you only get that in the masjid of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Uh, so on and so forth. So many of our acts of worship are tied into the masjid. So I was like, look, it's good we're talking about these problems. Now let's try and reform our masajid. Let's work on them and have real discussions about these are the problems. And to me, making space and opening our doors and being welcoming and fulfilling the needs of Muslims who have special needs is part of that conversation. Because we may think, once again, it's, if we sympathize with Muslims with special needs, we'll otherize them, right? We'll think of them as someone else. We need to empathize. We need to think to ourselves, how would I feel if there wasn't a space for me in the masjid? How would I feel if I came to the masjid and they said, well, you know what, for one reason or the other, you cannot attend the Jummah khutbah today. Or you cannot attend this lecture, you cannot attend this talk, or you cannot attend this activity that is happening in the masjid. We don't, we don't have the facility or facilities for you. The reality is, my brothers and sisters, that we all have needs and someone is fulfilling our needs. The fact that you're sitting here right now means someone fulfilled your needs. Somebody, and I don't know who it is, may Allah reward the brother or sister, put these chairs out here. Someone arranged for this room to be available. 
someone arranged for the microphone setup, and so on and so forth. All of these needs are being met and they're being fulfilled. We may not be aware of it, and we may take it for granted, but once again, if we're going to empathize, we have to ask ourselves, how would we care? What would we care? How much would we care if we were to not be included in things that or activities that we take for granted? And my brothers and sisters, the job that Muhsan is doing, by the way, is something that is fard kifaya. Meeting the needs of those who are neglected and underserved, those who have special needs, this is a communal obligation, meaning if they're not doing it, if nobody's doing it, may Allah protect us, we're all sinful. Right? So the fact that they have taken on this responsibility, and that's why when Sister Juhi from Muhsan said to me, like, uh, this is what our organization is, I was like, thank you. Jazakallah khair, because you know what? It's worrisome to think about this section of our community that was just not being served, that was being neglected, that was being ignored, that was being put aside. And the fact that you have taken the initiative, it is now upon every Muslim to say, how can I help you? Or let me help you with whatever I have available to myself. My brothers and sisters, the Prophet wasallam understood the importance of those members of our community that may be cast aside or put aside. If we're talking about special needs, subhanAllah, or, or the weak or the vulnerable, that time, 15, 14, 1500 years ago, Islam was at the forefront of meeting the needs of those with special needs. 14, 1500 years ago, if there was someone in, this, in society or in community with a, with a disability, they would be cast aside. They would be put aside from the community. Islam came, the Prophet ﷺ came, and not only did Islam come and say, you know what, we have to make space for them. Islam came and said, we have to create opportunities for them. Because if we offer them opportunities, we may find that they are the best amongst us. And if we don't create opportunities for them, we don't make space for them, then perhaps we may be held accountable. This is why the Prophet ﷺ he said, Abghuni du'afa'akum. He said, Bring to me the weak, the vulnerable amongst you. He said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Fa innakum innama turzaquna wa tunsaruna bi du'afa'ikum. He said, You are only innama, article of exclusivity. I don't want to get into details of Arabic grammar, but you are only given victory. You are only provided for it. You are only given sustenance because of the vulnerable amongst you. Why? How? One reason is because we know the vulnerable amongst us, those who deal with hardships and difficulties, that they are special people with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Anyone who goes through a difficulty and they're tried and tested by Allah and this person recognizes that this is a test from Allah, this is a person that inshallah ta'ala is beloved to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna Allah idha ahabba qawman, Ibtalahum. That if Allah loves a people, He tries and tests them to raise their status. First amongst them, the prophets. When the Prophet ﷺ was asked, who is tested the most severely? Who goes through the most difficulty? The Prophet ﷺ said, Al-Anbiya, the prophets. All of the prophets went through trials and difficulties. And then the Prophet ﷺ said, Thumma al-amthalu fal-amthal. Then the most like them and the most like them. Meaning the closer we are, to the prophets, the, the, likewise our trials will be severe as well. So by having these people in our community, those who deal with tests and trials, we are having, we have with us the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So closeness to the beloved of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala likewise brings us close to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why, you know, talking about empathy, if you were to ask the question, how do you build empathy? Well, one of the ways, one of the main ways to build empathy, empathy is through connection. You know, studies have found that simply sitting in the same room with another individual increases our level of empathy. They did these studies where they, you know, took two individuals who didn't know each other and they try to, you know, judge their empathy and they had very low empathy because they don't, you know, someone, someone you don't know, you don't, you don't know anything about them, it's hard to empathize, right? Then they took those people and they put them in a room together. 
and they gave him another test on empathy, and their empathy went, went up, even though they didn't have a single conversation. They didn't talk about anything. They were just in the room together. Their empathy went up. Then they had those two people talk about something, have a discussion, and their empathy went up. And then they had those two people do a task together. And as they completed a task together, their empathy went up. And so we learn, once again, this is found in our deen, congregation, jama'ah. Why do we congregate? Obviously, to fulfill the command from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, it's part of our deen. But the wisdom there, the wisdom there is, how are we going to have empathy with our brothers and sisters if we are not with them? What happens in the month of Ramadan during Taraweeh? Well, we're now shoulder to shoulder praying with our brothers and sisters, possibly something that we don't do throughout the rest of the year. And that's, it's at those times that we start to notice these little things that bother us. I don't know if this has ever happened to you. I'm not going to ask you to raise your hand if it's ever happened to you. But sometimes there's a brother praying next to you and maybe, you know, like his foot is just like, is stomping on your foot. Like it's always like, all right, brother, foot to foot, but like you got your foot on my foot, right? Or the pakora burps. Y'all know about that? Don't, you don't have to say yes. It's okay. Or whatever they had for, for, uh, for iftar, those burps, and whatever else, and some people... When they recite, they recite like it's quiet, but it's loud, right? Like, and you're like, come on, man, I can't concentrate. Like, just come on. All of those little things that bother us, that's good. Because that teaches us how to be patient with our brothers and sisters. How to live and coexist with our brothers and sisters, because that is our ummah. Right? How to be with one another. And we can live in our own homes and worship Allah in our own homes and we'll be fine for a while. But as you saw during the pandemic, it's not great for our faith. It's not great for our iman to be separated from our brothers and sisters. And so those difficulties that we put up with, we are the, we are the benefactors of that. We benefit from that in the long term. And, and lessons that when we contemplate on these issues, issues we see there is a reason why it is important to connect with our brothers and sisters. When we take care of the weak and vulnerable in our communities, we get rewarded by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. It is as the Prophet ﷺ told us that the dua of the weak and the vulnerable amongst us who helps, that, that helps us. As the Prophet ﷺ said, إِنَّمَا يُنصَرَ اللَّهُ هَذِي الْأُمَّةِ بِضَعِيفِهَا بِدَعْوَتِهِمْ وَصَلَاتِهِمْ وَإِخْلَاصِهِمْ he said, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, Allah supports this ummah because of their dua, because of their prayer, because of their ikhlas, because of their sincerity. And so when the companions, they would go out and they would take a party out to battle, amongst them were those who could not actually physically go out in the battle. Right? Amongst them were those who would get wounded in the battle. Amongst them are those who would be with the party but they are not actually out in the battlefield fighting. Ibn Abbas radiallahu ta'anhuma, he mentions that on one occasion, the Prophet وسلم, was distributing the spoils of war and Prophet وسلم, distributed to those as well, those who weren't actually physically fighting in the battle. And the Prophet وسلم, was asked, how, how come they get the spoils of war when they didn't physically fight? And the Prophet وسلم, he said, هَلْ تُنْسَرُونَ وَتُرْزَقُونَ إِلَّا بِدُعَفَائِكُمْ He said, do you think that your victory came, that this sustenance that you're getting, this wealth that you're getting, came except through the weak and the vulnerable amongst you? Except through what they contributed? And this shows us that the contribution of every individual is different. You know, we live in a society that judges a person's worth by their physicality, right? And oftentimes that translates into, well, physically, what can you contribute? And therefore, a person's value, we begin to think, lies in what they can physically contribute to our community. The Prophet ﷺ is changing the paradigm here. The Prophet ﷺ is saying that it's not just about physical contribution. Think about the sincerity in the dua of an individual who is dealing with difficulties and trials. And wallahi, you all know this. Those moments in your life when you went through difficulties and you, were, you, you knew that no one could help you except Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, you truly felt it, it is in those moments that your dua was possibly the most sincere that, than it's ever been. And once again, one of the reasons Allah puts us through trials is to bring us closer to Him. 
And imagine our brothers and sisters that have to deal with these difficulties, these hardships on a daily basis. How sincere is their dua? Are we not in need of their dua? What is our, what is our community without the dua of the vulnerable amongst us? The Prophet ﷺ said a hadith I'm sure many of you have heard. Inna Allah la yanzuru ila ajsadikum. Allah does not look at your bodies. Wala ila surikum. And Allah does not look at your faces. Wala kin yanzuru ila qulubikum. Rather, Allah looks at your hearts. And our deen teaches us the very opposite of the norm of the society today. Like I said, we live in a very, we live in a, a world that judges people's value based off of what we can see. And it's not even, even what we see isn't, isn't often real. I'm mean, talking about social media, Instagram, and TikTok, and so on and so forth. We judge people's values based off of what, like a one minute video? Right? Like that's it. We think this person is so amazing because of something, because of a character that they put on or, or, or an image that they crafted for themselves. And this is what they, that's how, and subhanAllah, our deen once again teaches us that people's value is not just physical, it's not just from the outside, rather it is about their hearts. And so when we take care of our brothers and sisters and our children with special needs, we are telling the world, we are telling the society that we live in that the Muslims are different. That we don't just look at people's physical traits or their physical features or their status or their wealth or their cars or their money, whatever, and, and, and value people based off of that. No, our community values people for their goodness, for their taqwa, for their God consciousness, for the potential that they have, and for, for the unique abilities that they may have that we don't know about, for their unique qualities that they may have that other people don't know about. Can we say that our masjid here, out of all of the other places of worship, out of all of the other faiths out there, our masjid, can we say, like the Prophet ﷺ, was at the forefront of making opportunities for those with special needs. Can we say that about our community? And wallahi, this is not to put anybody down or to say like, you know, we're not doing great. The point is that we have a lot of work to do. And that's why I started with saying, alhamdulillah, y'all took the first step. Silver, silver, right? Silver, cert certified, silver, alhamdulillah, that's the first step. What would be amazing is that I come visit you again in a year or a couple years, and then you come and you, and you tell me, or you tell anybody who's visiting your community that, forget tell, they can see, visually they can see that this is a community that serves, not just uh, allows, or not just helps, not just um, uh, assists, they, they serve those with special needs that they raise them up, they give them a special place because that was the sunnah of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa And honestly, there are many, many stories of the companions who had special needs and who the Prophet sallam not just allowed them to take part in the community, the Prophet sallam put them in leadership positions. The Prophet sallam put them in positions where they can flourish and shine and serve the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. I'll give you one example. Ibn Umm Maktoum, Abdullah Ibn Umm Maktoum. You may or may not have heard this name, but you most likely recited the verses in which he is referred to, radiallahu anhu ardahu, in the Quran. Abdullah Ibn Umm Maktoum was a companion of the Prophet one of the first converts to Islam, one of the first people to accept Islam in Mecca. His mom, Atika, radiallahu anha, she was a, a woman who was given the title Umm Maktoum, the mother of the concealed one, because her child was born blind. And so she was known as Umm Maktoum. And this child was Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. This was a companion who accepted Islam very early. And he had this quality of being very eager in his faith. He wanted to learn as much as he can. He wanted to learn the Quran. He wanted to memorize the Quran to the point that he would try to follow the Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam around and ask him questions, tell him to recite the Qur'an for him, he would say, what did Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reveal, recite it to me? What did Allah reveal, recite it to me? And there was a time where the Prophet Sallam, one of the strategies the Prophet Sallam employed was to reach out to the, to, the, to the chiefs or the chieftains in the Quraysh, which is a, a totally valid uh, strategy, right? 
you reach out to the leaders, people would influence, and obviously people would influence if they accept Islam, then how many hundreds and thousands, so on and so forth, other people would be influenced by them, and they can accept Islam as well. And so on one occasion, the Prophet ﷺ was giving da'wah to some of these chieftains, and the Prophet ﷺ is trying to get their attention, trying to explain to them, and Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he, uh, he comes to the Prophet ﷺ, and he says, O oh, Messenger of Allah, Ya Rasulullah, teach me from what Allah has taught you. Meaning, look at me, give me your attention. Right? And the Prophet ﷺ, even though he, he loved Abdullah, but right now, he's, the Prophet ﷺ is doing a job. Right? And I often think about my son. I'm not going to say his name. He's, he's like, Dad, you got to stop saying my name in your lectures. Like, you're giving me a bad name. Right? Nameless son of mine. <laughs> He does this thing with me where sometimes like I'm working on something and, and he'll come and those of you who have children, you know about this, right? Like, dad, 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 let me show you. I'm like, listen, man, look, I value you. I want to listen to you. Not right now because this is really important what I'm doing, <laughs> right? SubhanAllah, I think about that and I think about what happened with the Prophet Of course, what Abdullah ibn Maktoum was asking, the Prophet is totally valid. But right now is not the time. This is how the Prophet felt, right? Like, just, just hold on. Like, so the Prophet like, just, just, just wait. Right? Like, just turned his attention away from Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. And then the Prophet ﷺ tried to give da'wah to the leaders, the, the chieftains amongst the Quraysh. And the narration say that after he was done talking to them, we saw the effects of the revelation descend upon the Prophet. ﷺ. Right? And sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would feel like he's getting very, very heavy. Right? His head would pound and so on and so forth. He, would feel, he could feel the effects of the revelation. And what was the revelation that the Prophet ﷺ was receiving? Verses that we all know. Abasa wa tawalla. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, He frowned and turned away. Now, this is, the, this is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaking directly to the Prophet ﷺ, telling the Prophet ﷺ about what just happened. Abasa wa tawalla. Anja'ahu al-a'ma. When the one who was blind came to him. Right? And I just told you what, what happened. وَمَا يُدْرِيكَ لَعَلَّهُ يَزَّكَّ Allah is saying, how would you know? Or could you know? Or would you know? Can you perceive? Can you, can you tell that perhaps he might be purified? Meaning, what you're trying to do with these chieftains, which we said is completely valid, perhaps this person, he may be the one who could benefit the most. أَوْ يَذَّكَّرُ فَتَنْفَعُهُ الذِّكْرَ Or, he may be reminded and the remembrance would benefit him. Because the reality is, we all hear reminders all the time. But not all of us benefit from the reminders. Right? And that is truly with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, we don't know. Right? So right now, if we were to do like the equivalent of this, we would invite like the mayor and so on and so forth. And we would say, you know what, forget the community. We're just going to talk to the politicians. Right? But their guidance is not in our hands. Guidance comes from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, right? And we don't know what someone's true value is. It may be members of our community that we don't think about, that we have neglected. We think they have nothing to offer to the community, and they are in actuality, by the knowledge and will of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, they are of most value to our community. But perhaps we cannot perceive that. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Amma man istaghna. As for the person who thinks that they are self-sufficient, and this was the attitude of the Quraysh, right? They're like, we don't need Islam. We don't need this deen of yours. Like, you have nothing to offer to us. So that's those people. And then Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, who is saying, oh, Messenger of Allah, give to me. I need what you have. You see the difference between the two? There are people who feel so, like, we don't need Islam. We don't need what you have to offer. The religion of our forefathers is better than what you are preaching to us. And then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى أَمَّا مَنِ اسْتَغْنَى As for the one who thinks that they don't have any need, فَأَنْتَ لَهُ تَصَدَّى Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says to him, to that person, the one who thinks that they're self-sufficient, that is the person that you gave your attention to. وَمَا عَلَيْكَ أَلَّا يَزَّكَّى When the reality is, their Islam is not in your hands. You cannot... Make someone be guided. You cannot make someone be purified. It is, once again, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who controls someone's purification, someone's Islam. وَأَمَّا مَنْ جَاءَكَ يَسْعَى As for the one who came to you, desperately seeking your attentions, desperately seeking what you have to offer. وَهُوَ يَخْشَى 
And he is the one who has the khashya of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He is the one who is conscious and fearful of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, meaning his level of spirituality is very, very high. This is the person Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is telling the Prophet who you turned your face away from. فأنت, فأنت and you turned, you were distracted by the chieftains of the Quraysh. Kalla innaha tadhkira. No, indeed, these are reminders. These verses of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, this Quran, this revelation, this is a reminder from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. فَمَنْ شَاءَ ذَكَرَ And whoever wills will remember. And so what do we see here? We see here a lesson that was taught to the Prophet ﷺ by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That the value of people, the true value of people, we don't know. And so we cannot think one person does not deserve it because of certain traits that they may have. And this other person, they deserve it. Who gets to decide which Muslim in our community deserves to listen to a lecture? Well, you may say, well, I, I don't, I know, I'm not, I'm not, you know, I'm not excluding everyone. Well, exclusion doesn't always happen consciously. Exclusion sometimes happens when we just don't care. Exclusion sometimes happens because of neglect. Because we have neglected to create opportunities and spaces for people with special needs, we end up excluding them. And that is the conversation that we're having today. That's what we're talking about today. And I'm not here to, and I don't think any of you, any of my brothers and sisters, I don't think bad of any of you. I know that as believers, the fact that you are here today means you have goodness in your heart, inshallah ta'ala. There is goodness in you. And that is why it is important for us to understand that once we begin to empathize, once we begin to think of our brothers and sisters as our own, once we begin to say, how would I want to be treated if I had special needs? How would I want my children to be treated if they had special needs? Once we begin to personalize the message, it will become very, very different. And the story of Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, he went on to be this great companion. He was one of the two individuals the Prophet ﷺ picked to send to Medina to give da'wah over there. Musa'ib ibn Umair and Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the two companions. And Musa'ib ibn Umair was a young person, he's got his own story, amazing. Two people that we would never think of to make leaders, the Prophet ﷺ put him in charge of teaching the Qur'an, teaching the message of Islam to the people of Medina. Emissaries of the Prophet ﷺ, one's a young person, in his teens, some narrations say, in his teens, a young person. You know, we look at our young people and we're like, you know what, just move aside. Right? What, what do you have to offer? The second was a companion, Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, who was blind. Right? We may look at that and say, well, you know, they may be restricted and so on and so forth. Can they really, can they really do what others can do? And so on? No, the Prophet ﷺ knew the potential that he had. The Prophet ﷺ knew the, the merit a, a, that, that he had. The Prophet ﷺ knew the, the goodness that was found in Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum. And Wallahi, my brothers and sisters, as I said, this is one story. I could be here for hours mentioning companion after companion after companion who we may look at. And I often think about this pattern life. A companion walked into our masjid and we didn't know they were a companion. How would we treat them? You know, one thing I was studying, subhanAllah, there's a class I, I, uh, I teach called Trends. It deals with the fiqh of like clothing and so on and so forth, dress and clothing and all that. And I began to uh, research uh, like what the companions look like and how they dressed and so on and so forth. And one of the things we learned about Umar radiallahu an, and I know this is a weird thing, right, but I'm just going to say it anyway. Umar radiallahu an, many of the narrations about him mention that he was balding, right? And we think of Umar radiallahu an in our minds, this amazing personality, this amazing individual. Right? How many of us would, I, would think that he is someone who is balding? Right? Because in our society, in our, once again, we live in a very visual society, right? where people's worth is based off of how they look and, 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 and you know, are they considered um, you know, good looking and so on and so forth. And even when we pick politicians and so on and so forth, Trump being the exception. <laughs> anyway, other than that, right? We tend to pick people, and there's studies on this, that you know, if someone is better looking, they have more chances of being elected and so on and so forth, right? But this is something that, subhanAllah, I think about this, that if Umar radiallahu an walked into our masjid today, would we be in awe of him if we didn't know anything, if we didn't know it was him, right? And some of the other companions, Jalaybib, uh, uh, and so many of the other companions, Abdullah bin Mas'ud, we knew he had a problem in one of his legs, right? 
and he was weak, and he would, he, would, he would walk a little different, and so on and so forth. Some people, all these different physical traits, but you never in the books, and in our minds, these are giants. Why? Not because of their physical traits, because of their iman, because of their taqwa, because of what they accomplished in the faith. And they accomplished that because the Prophet ﷺ made room, allowed for them to flourish. He gave them opportunities to flourish. If the Prophet ﷺ did not create opportunities for people with special needs, we would have so many of our companions that we, we, wouldn't, we would not hear about them today. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum was also, by the way, one of the two mu'adhins with Bilal radiallahu an. Abdullah ibn Umm Maktoum, the one who was blind, was also the one who the Prophet would leave to lead the prayer in Medina when the Prophet would travel, and so on and so forth. There are so many merits of these companions. My brothers and sisters, I want to end, inshallah ta'ala, with what I started with, and that is empathy. Empathy means, once again, to, to look at an individual, to see what someone is going through, and ask yourself, how, how would I want to be treated if I was in this situation? And as I said, this is a core aspect of our deen, a hadith that even young children learn. لا يؤمن أحدكم حتى يحب لأخيه ما يحب لنفسه that none of you truly believes until you love for your brother what you love for yourself. Do we think about this when it comes to our brothers and sisters with special needs? Do we think about this when we see our brothers and sisters who are being neglected and who are not being served in our communities? And here the Prophet said, لا يؤمنوا. You don't believe, meaning there's something lacking in your faith, there's something lacking in your iman. If you look at another brother or sister, and you don't ask yourself the question, how would I want to be? What would I love for myself? And that is wallahi, problematic if we, if we don't have that, that mindset with our brothers and sisters. And that applies to everyone. You know, there's a hadith that often gets um, quoted when we're talking about our brothers and sisters overseas. And that is the hadith of the ummah being one body. Right? That if, there's a, if, if, uh, if one part of the body feels some pain, the rest of the body feels some pain. We all know this hadith. And yes, it should be applied to our brothers and sisters who are going through difficulty and trials overseas. But it equally applies to our brothers and sisters who are dealing with trials here with us. And we can even argue, an argument can be made, and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best, that the fact that they are closer to us in proximity... The fact that we have the ability to help them more means that they have a higher, we have a higher obligation upon us to help them. Because that is something that we can actually change. We can actually make a difference. So I want to leave you, inshallah ta'ala, with a couple things that you can do. So what can be done? Number one, what you shouldn't do is think to yourself, yeah, this is a problem. Hopefully you guys understand. This is, there's a need. What we shouldn't be doing is saying, this is a problem and they need to solve it. And they can be anyone. They can be, the imam needs to solve it. The masjid board needs to solve it. You know what? The volunteers need to solve it. Because that's, that's, that's a way for us to escape responsibility. And it makes us feel good, right? Sometimes when we criticize others, we feel like we're actually doing something when we're actually not doing anything at all. We can actually be causing more detriment to the cause when all we do is criticize. So we have to get out of the mindset of they, them, like they have to solve this problem. They got to they gotta do it and this is a problem and so on and so forth. It's got to be us. It's got to be me. So we have to ask ourselves, what can I do? So number one, obviously donate, right? Put your money where your mouth is. If someone says, you know, I can do nothing else, give whatever you can. Number two, Educate yourself. Educate yourself and educate others as well. When Sister Juhi asked me and she said, do you want to help? I said, yeah. I was like, okay, what can I do? She said, just talk to people about it. Right? Just go talk. Just talk. Educate yourself and just talk to people about it because the reality is that we don't know. Our, our people in our community just don't know. We feel like this problem doesn't exist, once again, because we're not exposed to it. And you as an individual, amongst your friends, amongst your family, amongst your, your social circle, all you have to do is say, look, guess what, guess what I found out in the masjid today? There's an organization called Muhsin. They are serving our brothers and sisters with special needs. Right? And there is a need and so on and so forth. 
Number three, identify the people that need help. And I don't mean, hey, you know, we have to do a survey and so on and so forth. Reach out to people, people that you may not see in the masjid, and ask them what they need. And oftentimes people with special needs, people with disabilities, people with, you know, mental health, so on and so forth, we oftentimes talk about them and we exclude them from the conversation. Right? And so it's very important that we make them part of the conversation and ask them what they need. And alhamdulillah, like I said, Muhsin has done all this work. Right? They just need our support. Alhamdulillah. Encourage them to come to the masjid. I cannot tell you the amount of people that I have met in these last 10 years or so since I've been lecturing publicly and so on and so forth. I graduated from Medina in 2011. More than 10 years, subhanAllah. Decade. I can't tell you the amount of people that have come up to me at one of my seminars, because our seminars are generally held not in the masjid, right? And they are kind of marketed to like a younger audience, and they, they give the impression that they're more open and welcoming and so on and so forth. So I got a lot of people who come to me, and they're like, you know, I want to be a better Muslim and so on and so forth. What do I do? And I say, one of the things I tell them is, you know, you got you to gotta be a part of your community. And they're like, yeah, but you know what? This happened to me in the community. And that happened to me in the community. And you know, I tried to go the, to the masjid, but I experienced this and experienced that. And y'all know the stories, right? Like nail polish and this, and this is not right, and that's not right. All this stuff, right? And so there is a lot of negativity around our masajid. So we need to be the people who reach out to others and say, you know what? I will be your companion. I will be with you. I want to, just like I did with my son. Because when I brought my son to the masjid, I knew the masjid's not perfect. I know the masjid's got issues. But one thing that I had faith in, after Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, is that I can protect him. If something bad happens, he has a bad experience, I'm there to tell him, you know what? This is just this one person, or this is a bad situation, whatever it may be, so that I am a correct, I'm a good representative for this deen. Lastly, the next thing you can do, inshallah ta'ala, is attend the next presentation. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows best. Subhanakallahumma wa bihamdik. Ashhadu an la ilaha illa ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Wa jazakumullahu khaira. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh.